Hello everyone and welcome to MedTube channel again and today's topic is about shock which is a very high yield clinical topic. Now shock is defined as a state of cellular and tissue hypoxia despite oxygenated blood. This means that the problem could be either in perfusion which is the distribution of the blood which is of course the most common mechanism or it could be due to increased oxygen consumption as in septic shock or it could be due to inadequate oxygen utilization as seen in mitochondrial dysfunction due to carbon monoxide poisoning or cyanide poisoning. Now clinically, we have four main types of shock. The first is called hypovolemic shock, which is the most common type. The second is cardiogenic shock, and the third is distributive shock, and lastly but not least is the obstructive shock. So let's have a quick description of each of these types. The first is hypovolemic shock, which is again the most common type of shock. It could be classified into hemorrhagic shock and non-hemorrhagic shock. The hemorrhagic could be either internal or external, and the non-hemorrhagic is due to GI losses, as in vomiting and diarrhea, or skin losses, as in excessive sweating, or renal losses, as in renal diseases, or finally, as in third spacing, all of which will result in dehydration. And hypovolemic shock has itself four classes depending on the severity of the dehydration. And they are classified according to the blood loss, the blood pressure, the respiratory rate, and the urine output. The second type of shock is called the obstructive shock, and it could be due to cardiac tamponade, tension pneumothorax, massive pulmonary embolism, severe valvular stenosis of potentially any of the valves, constrictive pericarditis, and restrictive cardiomyopathy, and other causes not mentioned here. And what happens here is that you have an obstruction to the outflow of the blood out of the heart. And then we have the cardiogenic shock, which is a shock due to a cardiac cause, as in myocardial ischemia, congestive heart failure, arrhythmias, cardiomyopathies, and valvulopathies, and other causes not mentioned here. And finally, we have distributive shock, in which we have systemic vasodilation resulting in warm extremities. And this is seen in septic shock, inflammatory shock, as seen in pancreatitis and burns, and then we have anaphylactic shock, neurogenic shock, and finally endocrine shock, as seen in adrenal crisis and mixed edema coma. So this is just a very quick description of the four main types of shock, and here we have the hemodynamic changes associated with the different types of shock, and if you notice here, the hallmark is that you have a decrease in the blood pressure in all of the types of the shock, and this is the most important clinical sign of shock. The heart rate is usually increased in all of them, except in cardiogenic shock as it could be normal or decreased in certain cardiac conditions. The JVP, the jugular venous pressure, is increased only in cardiogenic shock and obstructive shocks, whereas it is decreased in hypovolemic shock and distributive shock. And finally, the extremities are called in all of the types of the shock due to decreased delivery of the blood to the peripheral tissues, except in the distributive shock in which there are warm extremities because of the peripheral vasodilation and therefore peripheral pooling of the blood. And regarding the treatment, the most important thing is to treat the underlying cause in order to restore the perfusion of the tissues. Because the problem is usually perfusion, except in certain types of shock in which we want to decrease the consumption or we want to increase the tissue extraction of oxygen, as in carbon monoxide poisoning. So for example, if we have a hypovolemic shock, the most important next step is fluid resuscitation. If we have a septic shock, the best next step is to give IV broad spectrum antibiotics, but of course after getting a blood specimen for blood culture, as the antibiotics could compromise the culture results. And at the same time, it would be very important to maintain the hemodynamic function as the antibiotics will take a while to get into action. And to do this, we will also start fluid resuscitation and even IV vasopressors and inotropes if required. And your goals of the treatment of the septic shock will be according to the early goal-directed therapy guidelines, which will be explained in the next video, hopefully. And if we have a tension pneumothorax, your treatment will be completely different. We would perform actually a needle thoracostomy and afterwards we will insert a chest tube and your obstructive shock will reverse afterwards. If we have a cardiogenic shock, then we would aim to treat the cardiac cause in order to improve the cardiac output. So this is just a quick summary to give you an overall idea about the treatment of shock. Now lastly, a very important statement to make is that shock is only reversible in its early stages. 
So if shock is not diagnosed and treated very early, this can result in irreversible tissue damage, multi-organ failure, and even death. This is all for this video. Thank you very much for watching, and please watch my next video on sepsis and septic shock.